Joe, thank you for jumping in and joining and talking with me for a few minutes. You're welcome, Mr. English teacher. Well, thanks, thanks, thanks. You call me do, Jason. Do, That's do, do your students call you Mr. or Jason? They they do. I, I have the doctor thing, too. So sometimes they call me Mr. D or Dr. D. Um, I get oh. a nice mix of both, and they have a variety of nicknames for me. Your, your doctor what? Literacy. Let's let's interview you. What, sure, what you? sure. What would you like to know? <laughs> how many, how many, what, were you ever planning on making a living with it, or was this just a pie in the sky hope? <laughs> so. Oh, the doctorate or the podcast? <laughs> the doctorate. Oh, well, you know, it's it's nice. It's opened some doors with publishing. I will say that. Yeah, um, okay. I don't know if a doctorate in education made anybody rich ever, unless they invented some kind of a program for something. But uh, I always wanted to be a writer. And so it's opened yeah. some doors for that. How do, how do you know as a writer that you're better? As an artist, you can look at your work and go, oh, yeah, I, I know what I'm doing more now. But as a writer, you look at your book from 10 years ago. Uh, yeah, that looks like a book, all right. <laughs> that's right that's right maybe it's thicker maybe it makes more sense i don't know i don't know for me i i sound a little bit less like david mamet who i really tried to imitate when i first started writing oh, oh. yeah so 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 you, you know david mamet i saw a documentary about him and he said to his acting class he went i taught you all i can i know just just let's go get a beer and he just <laughs> he sort of stopped the class because like what else do you need to know now so i love it i love it my high school students would love that. <laughs> a, a beer, okay, right? Sure. <laughs> we'll just stop. We'll we'll go. Yeah, um, go. yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah, so we we talk a lot on here about comics and literacy and uh, people that have been kind in the industry and all of those kind of things. Well, I immigrated to to the U.S. from Israel when I was five years old, and my older cousin had the Superman family comic books primarily. So I, I must have gotten enthralled with the pictures since I couldn't read the language. But consequently, I knew words like imaginary long before and invulnerable long before the rest of the punks in the class did. And if they ever learned it. And when I was, I think in um, seventh grade, I was tested at, I think the highest you could go was 11, nine or something. And I was 11, eight, you know, so obviously, yeah. whatever whatever vocabulary I retained over the years is just by reading comic books by verbose comic book writers. So, I love it. I love it. Yeah. Oh, by, the, by the way, verbose comic book writers is a redundancy. But... <laughs> is that so? That's an assumed thing. It comes with the job. Oh, it's so assumed. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> there's 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 um, I I shan't mention who they are because they're not dead yet. But we can hope. Um, they were two um, artists who became writers who had to show you how wonderful a writer they were. So they proceeded to um, excavate William F. Buckley's vocabulary, whatever they could. Oh, and, nice. Yeah. You, you know, and, and, and Buckley was a blowhard on so many levels. But it's, it's like, you know, as, as much of a creep as Ernest Hemingway was by all reports, at mm -hmm. least he's given credit for giving a short and succinct sentence when he wrote. True. So, yeah. That journalism background, that'll do it. Yeah. 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 Uh, so right now in my class, you mentioned Superman um, and a couple of pieces there. We're actually reading Superman Birthright. And one of the things that I was pointing out to the class yesterday was, you know, here in this comic, we've got kind of the story of Moses in a way. Like baby, in Superman a was always Superman was always Moses. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I don't, I don't know how Jewish um, Siegel and Schuster were, but mm -hmm. they must have been exposed to some sort of rudimentary Bible study. And right. you know, by the way, I know I knew Siegel and Schuster when I was a kid. Wow. And, yeah. and I, I've mentioned this once or twice. People always think I'm joking. Like, oh, or you're so old. And it's like, well, I was 15 or 14 and they were 65 or something, you know. And yeah. so, so they seemed really old at the time. I'm, I'm that age now. So, but yeah, I knew Siegel and Schuster. I mean, how many people do you know who um, are acquainted with the people who started music, literature, 
art, science, you know, but, yeah. but because, because comic books is such a relatively young world, I knew the people who started comic books. I mean, Julie Schwartz kind of invented fandom and, mm -hmm. um, you know, the people who were there in the forties, like Joe Kubert was like 12 years old when he started to ink for comic books, I think in 1940 or something. Um, so I knew Kubert and I knew Cedar Schuster and I knew Julie Schwartz um, and lots of the old guys. Because in comic books, I, I think like most entertainment industries, they don't care who you are or what degrees you have or what college you graduated from. Mm -hmm. Can you just do it? Mm -hmm. So um, I was 17 when I got my first freelance job at DC Comics. And I remember Joe Orlando, who was an artist, editor at dc who went we, we used to think al williamson was young you know because al was like 21 or something when he started you know and i was like 17 but so i i was the youngest guy in comic books for a minute there so can you see my cat in the picture by the way it, it kind of zoomed in but i'm getting some whiskers now yeah we, oh, we okay. love the zoom pets we have a couple of schnauzers over here yeah well yeah. okay yeah. Uh, was that intimidating for you being a younger person? Was there some imposter syndrome that came? Oh, yeah. Out? Yeah, well, absolutely. Um, see, when I, so you have to understand, I started as a gopher errand boy when I was 13 years old at Dick Giordano Neil Adams studio. Yeah. And Dick, Dick was a wonderful, well loved man. And Neil was the other kind. <laughs> and, um, I'm, I'm not uh, telling secrets here. Yeah. And um, so by the time I, so of course, you know, I mean, it's it's the early 70s and and all of a sudden there's Bernie Wrightson and Michael Kluda and Jim Starlin and, you know, Frank Miller and all that. And these people show up and they're good. They're really good. And I want to be a comic book artist. And um so I happened to have fallen into being an inker because, which is not the colors, by the way, God damn it. Um, so <laughs> That's right. My, They're different parts. They're right, different right, right. roles. My, my, my father never understood what any of that meant. Um, and so in an interview in a very fine magazine called Alter Ego Number 10, uh, interviewed by Roy Thomas, Gil Kane said that he should have been an inker before a penciler so he could learn the industry. And I went, oh, okay, I'll be an inker. Because uh -huh. my favorite inker in the world was right there, Dick Giordano. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And and my favorite penciler in the world was there, Neil Adams. So I'll learn inking and then I'll learn penciling. Um, and I got proficient at it. I got good at it. I got hired to do it. And then I just kept going, you know. And ultimately, while I did love comic books, I was drawn to painting and illustrating. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And so given a choice between five hours of drawing a comic book page or five hours of doing a painting, I'd much rather do a painting. Uh -huh. But, but in the old days when I was 15, 16, 17 years old, let's say there was an arm in a particular position. I would find every scrap I could find of an arm close to that position. And then I'd figure out which one was closest and then I'd copy it. And so that's how I proceeded. And I would never let anybody watch me because then they'd realize all I was was an imposter who was just a copyist. Uh -huh. and, th and then about two years into it, it occurred to me that if I gave you the same reference, you can't do my job. So I must know something. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And and so now it's if you count when I started with Dick when I was 15, it's now 50 years later. Now I'm at comic book conventions and I'm sitting there and there are literally thousands of people walk by while I'm doing my work. And can I see that? I hold it up and whatever it is like. So that's pretty much the opposite side of that coin. You know, so <laughs> so I guess I'm not. A, I mean, you know, in, in all truth, um, doctor, I hope you're charging me for this. Um, <laughs> please, I, um, Jason. Yeah. Please. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm not really a comic book artist because I don't really know how to draw a page. I can draw a figure. OK. Um, and I just won first place in a national watercolor competition, except I'm not really a watercolorist because I don't do it like watercolors do it. <laughs> and I'm not really an illustrator and I'm not, and I'm not really anything, you know, but I'm kind of, 
plotting my way through all of it and hoping something good shows up at the other end. <laughs> I mean, the one, the one thing I am is an anchor. I know full yeah. well that I'm a, I'm a good anchor. Um, but yeah, so I'm not an impo- And you know, the thing about inking is if you're a penciler, you immediately know if you're any, they know if you're any good or not. Uh-huh. It's like Joe Kubert said, it's not your first job. That's the hard one to get. It's your second job because your first one took you six months and your second one is due next week. And uh-huh. then you do it. Right. So I, I can sit down and do it, you know, and, and if, I mean, my, my idol in how to use a pen is a guy named Stan Drake who did a comic strip called the heart of Juliet Jones. Stan went on at the end of his life to do Blondie. Uh And um, I don't need to look at Stan's stuff, but I look at Stan's stuff and say, Oh, look, that's a line I wouldn't have thought of, or he made that thick and that thin. And I would have done just the reverse. Why is he doing that? What, What's going on there? And that sparks ideas and trying new things. So, um, you know, I still look at Neil Adams and I still look at, but I look at all the people that Neil Adams looked at, Stan Drake and Joe Kubert and Mm -hmm. Alex Raymond, you know, and I was Wally Woods' assistant for a while and Russ Heath's assistant. And I helped out that crowd at the early 70s, like like Jansen and Bob McLeod. Um, And, you know, if you... If you don't really, really, really try to be another person, you just might wind up as yourself. <laughs> I love that. That's a great yes. statement. Yeah. I, I, I'm i having that on a coffee cup. I'll, I'll get it to you. I like it. I like it. Or a t-shirt. Okay. I love it. Yeah. Okay. Right. So you're continuing, you're talking about watercolor. You're continuing to play with media and forms and, and different ways <laughs> of creating as well, it sounds like. Yeah, I'm, I'm playing. Yes, I'm playing. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus. You know, who? I don't know who it was that said writing is easy. All you have to do is sit there and open a vein, you know? <laughs> and and it's, I don't think art is much different. I mean, it's trying to do a good piece of artwork is like trying to pick up a ball bearing with chopsticks left handed. It's like, <laughs> you know, it's like, Bill Sienkiewicz, not Sienkiewicz, Sienkiewicz, the guy who does Moon Knight. Mm-hmm. Um, he says the first 10 minutes is fun and then the rest of the piece you're trying to save it. <laughs> you know? Wow. And and I work I work in every media, um, depending upon what the job is all about. And it's all exactly the same thing. Colors and shapes and values and edges and all that sort of stuff. But um, I'm... I'm still trying to figure it out. I'm trying, still trying to be better. I have a, a high school painting teacher. His name is Max Ginsburg. Mm-hmm. And Max is still alive. He's 93 years old. Wow. Um, and, and Max is great. Max is not lost a thing. And Max says, well, you learn something new every day. I go, you're 93 years old and you're learning something new every day. And you're at that level. You know? Yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, it's, Inking, inking is boring, by the way, because it's all black uh-huh. and you're following somebody else's work. whoop de doo <laughs> You know, I mean, my what what I have never said whoop de doo in my life. There's something happening here. I think it's <laughs> it's it's a transitory stroke. I don't know. I so, love it. Um, it's, it's great. Yeah. It's great. It okay. could be the for you. Life. For you. <laughs> so um if 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 you look at the people before Dick Giordano, uh-huh. if you decide that he's the demarcation point. Um, I said to Joe Kubert once, who's who's my favorite comic book artist ever? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Jack Kirby is God. Neil Adams draws better than anybody ever did. Gene Colan does a mood you can't believe. But Kubert, you know, Tarzan fighting a gorilla with his muscles going and the fur flying just excites me to look at that stuff, right? Yeah. yeah. So, so, so Kubert told me once that when he inks somebody else's work, like his son's, for instance, um, it's mine now. So that mm-hmm. means I'm going to do with it what I want. Well, that's great. Except I don't agree with any of that. <laughs> because it's like when you get a, a John Buscema job, 
-hmm. You'd like to have it look like John Buscema when it's done. John would like it to look like John Buscema when it's done. When 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 you get uh, a Gene Colan job, you don't lightly erase it and then do whatever the hell you want to it. Mm -hmm. You try to so so. My thing is, I want to follow what you, the penciler did. Hopefully, not hurt it. Preferably, help it a little bit. Mm -hmm. So, I think I'm the and and, and a lot of pencilers. Have, I, I by the way have um, the Guinness World Record for having inked more characters and pencilers ever. Oh, wow. If it exist, if it existed, which it doesn't. Ah, I I said that as a joke once. And and I keep seeing it being printed everywhere. Guinness World Record over Joe Livingston. <laughs> and 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 finally, just to try and make it the truth, I wrote Guinness. I said, uh -huh. "Would you like me to include me in your book?" And they said, "No, no, no. We're busy counting how many nickels can go up a guy's nose." <laughs> you know. <laughs> so you know priorities and all. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's money. What you got money when it's done? <laughs> right. So, and, Anyway, um, you can probably hear my other cat whining. Anyway, oh, that, um, that works. It's fine. <laughs> so, I want to have. Imagine this. This will never happen. They find a five-page, unpublished, penciled Frank Frazetta job. Mm -hmm. Oh mm -hmm. my god! And they give it to Alfredo Alcala. And you hear about this and the book comes out and you open it up and you tear through it and you can't find Farzetta anywhere. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then you go back and you look at the, re uh, the credits and you find out that that five page Alfredo Alcala job started as Frank Farzetta. And you go, what the hell was that? It's a mm. beautiful job. It's an undeniably beautiful job because Alfredo was a genius, but it's not Frank Farzetta. Right. So a lot of pencilers have told me that I'm their favorite inker because I work hard to try and keep it as them and not just obliterate it. I, it's sort of like um, if we're running a relay race around a track and the guy just handed me the baton and I went, yeah, I'm going over there. <laughs> right. I'm going to sit down here. <laughs> yeah. I don't care what your intentions were for this job. I have an other idea. And, and as I said, if you get somebody who's a superior draftsman, like Kevin Nolan, Alfredo Alcala, Tony DiSamiga, you're going to get a great job. Mm -hmm. but is it true to the intention and that's and that's what i do to try and give it a little bit of interest is change my approach to be true to the intention as a matter of fact i did um i was speaking of cuba um we did this charity book like 1986 for african relief called heroes for hunger mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. um to my complete surprise and terror i got a two-page joe Kubert job to ink yeah. And um, when it got published, Marshall Rogers called me up and said, hey, your name is on this job, but it's it's, it's wrong because it's obvious that Kubert inked it. I went, no, that's me. Oh, I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it without him, but yeah. I kept it, you know, and, and so that was something to be proud of. I also did a like a three part Spider-Man Wolverine, uh, like six pages each uh, installment comic book. I think it was called Marvel Presents, maybe. Um, and they put the three parts together and they published it and they left my name off of it because they just thought that Eric Larson had drawn inked it. Why would they why would they think otherwise? Because I followed Eric Larson, you know. So that yeah. that makes inking a little bit more interesting. But but you know, in all truth, I would rather spend that time doing a painting because I am I am not the greatest thing for ever lived, but I'm definitely proficient. I don't have a doubt that if you give me a job, it will be professional when it turns out the other end. But if you make me paint a portrait, who knows what's coming out? And that that keeps me on my toes and interested and awake. So there's the difference. Yeah, yeah. And that that inking stage is so critical sure. between the pencil and the color. I mean, that's a well, a well for all part of, of it. For all of you people who haven't attended Dr. Jason's class, let me let and me. There let are me, many that have not. There are many. <laughs> let me let me let me explain you what inking really is. Okay. So let's say a musician, a composer, looks at a blank sheet of paper and creates something from nothing, and a comic book penciler 
has a concept of what he should do, whether it's a script or, or just a general thought, and he creates something from nothing. Okay. okay. So the musical composer hands it to a musician and says, here, don't hurt my baby. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And the musician says, well, am I going to use a tuba or a piano on this one? And if he follows the exact same notes, the tuba will definitely make it a different piece of music than the piano uh -huh. or, or or the guitar. Let's say and he, and he said, I'll go with a guitar. OK, so he says, all right, well, is it flamenco, jazz, classical? Should I improv? So obviously the musician who's been given this thing that came from nothing can completely and totally misrepresent the intentions or help the intentions or maybe transcend the intentions. Uh -huh. So I'm given a pencil job to do. And it's like, well, do I respect this job? Do I want to keep every line just the way it is? Or is it terrible and I need to fix it? If I Am I going to use a, a brush or a pen? If I use a pen, is it going to be a flexible pen so I can do all these curvy arabesques? Or is it going to be a stiff pen so I have to do a very kinetic kind of line? So ultimately, what I want to do with this thing is what you're going to wind up with. Uh -huh. And hopefully, it's what should have been done instead of whatever the hell I felt like doing. I spoke, I spoke, uh, I spoke to an anchor once, and he had two jobs by Todd McFarlane. This is like decades ago. Uh -huh. Two jobs by Todd McFarlane. And he, he said, yeah, I decided to ink them differently. But I'm going to do this way, and I'm going to do that. I said, well, are they penciled differently? He said, no, but I'm just going to do whatever I want. I went, no, no. He didn't ask you to do whatever you wanted. He, he drew it the way he drew it. You can decide to give it a different, you know, instead of an Italian accent, you can give it a French accent. But but, but you can't just whatever I want. And, you know, the, the, the guy I'm thinking about was never very good at what he did anyway. So it makes <laughs> sense that he would. And, and you know, look. You, you don't have to follow my rules and my philosophy. Kevin Nolan doesn't change his style as far as I can see when he inks anybody. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. But it sure is nice. And Frank Frazetta sure turned Al Williamson and whoever else he inked into some really nice artwork. They yeah. happen to be against what I think they should have done. But, you know, there's no no denying success. Yeah. Yeah. Well, with the with the idea in mind of folks that you've worked with in the industry, I read somewhere that you gave Art Adams his first job. Yeah. Um, I, well, I hope you mean art job because it could go a whole other way. Okay. <laughs> right, right. Yes, yes, true. Um, Arthur, <laughs> Arthur Arthur showed me his stuff at his convention, I think in San Francisco or something. And I said, hey, you're really great. Send me some samples and I'll bring them up to Marvel and show them around. So I wait a month. And this package shows up and it's like a 22 page job. Supergirl. Mm -hmm. He sends me a Supergirl job to Marv. He draws a Supergirl job to Marv. And so I, I took it and made it into three page packets. I stapled it. I wrote his contact info and I just walked from office to office and I handed it out and he got a job to do. And you'll notice I've never inked anything he's done. Yeah. Except like Marvel Universe entries or something you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but actually there was an issue an, an x-men annual that arthur did um and for some reason they had to hand it out and i got this one page of uh storm when she had her mohawk sort mm -hmm. of soaring up with the oh i think it might have been with thor's hammer and took forever mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like i'm i'm happy not to ink arthur's stuff it takes forever so. <laughs> Are there other folks that um, maybe you met early on in their career and you're especially proud of the way that they've grown and contributed? You mean that I had something to do with or just, or just saw their work? Uh, well, I was thinking more that you had something to do with. Well, look, I do not want to take credit for, for Frank Miller's career, but Frank was this skinny kid from Vermont who was starving and I used to buy him lunches. So if, <laughs> if you're Frank Miller fans, he would have been dead without me. So, okay. <laughs> so, so all of you owe me. Um, and I mean, Frank would show me his pages and I would correct some of his anatomy. Again, I didn't lay it out. I didn't draw it. I don't take credit for it. 
I would just sort of show him his anatomy mistakes. And then I think the reason I ain't, whoops, I think the reason I ain't Frank's first Daredevil cover is because he wasn't sure who was going to do it. And he trusted me. And that's how I wound doing his first cover instead of Jansen. And then a couple of issues later, I inked the Hulk issue in Daredevil and Jansen inked the cover. So we traded off by accident. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm a Frank Miller fan. I, I would buy Daredevil and I would read it first uh-huh. and then go back and look at it. Because if I looked at it, I'd lose all track of the story. Uh-huh. So I had to, you know, and then I'd go back and look at what was going on. Um, and, you know, most of my assistants, uh, you know, comic books is a lot of work. To do a comic book in 21 days is a lot of work. Yeah. And uh, that's why we have assistants. I, I was Wally Wood and Dick Giordano's assistant. Russ Eats, I helped out a little bit. Bob McLeod, Klaus Jansen. Um, and I had assistants because Wally Wood had assistants. And why not? And um, they would do backgrounds. They would do cars and buildings and stuff I hate to do. And I would do the wonderful gnarly trees and the water and the organic shit, you know. Um, and unfortunately, the word got out that my assistants did all the work, which was not true. And I had an editor call me up once and said, well, I want to give you this job, but you're going to do it, right? It's like, yes, I do them. Why would I give away the fun parts? Why would I give away, you know, the big heads and the big figures and all that sort of stuff? Um, but yeah, so so like like Tom Christopher was my assistant on the Silver Surfer. And then I got really bored and I gave it to Tom. And I think he did it for like the next 30 issues or something like that. And um, Kyle Baker, who I think is a genius. Mm-hmm. Um, Kyle is uh, half black or half white or something. And I think it's the left half. And um, he showed me. At, up at Marvel, I saw a drawing of Captain America and Buckwheat, right? <laughs> yeah. And it was great. It was a wonderful drawing. Who did that? Kyle did that. You want to be my assistant? Okay. So um, Kyle credits me with giving him a direction in his life because he wasn't sure what he was going to do until I said, you want to be my assistant? And he was sort of plodding along and doing okay and all that stuff. And then one day, day the, the fuse lit. And he just went, woo, you know. And uh, Kyle, Kyle called, me, call, uh, called me up one day and said, I got this Spider-Man that's due on uh, Thursday or Friday. Can I come by on Wednesday and you help me ink it? I went, oh, okay. And he came in and he had a 22-page Mark Silvestri, Peter Parker, Sp- Spider-Man, untouched, untouched. Yike. <laughs> and I... And I sat there and I inked five pages, which is a lot. And then I went, I, I can't do this. Anymore. I gotta go to sleep. And I left him sitting on my couch. And then he spent the night and finished the rest of the book. Mm-hmm. But, but that's not the best part of the story. He had a 22 page New Mutants Butch Guys layouts he hadn't touched either. <laughs> so, so he inked 37 pages overnight. Wow. They looked a little rushed. A little mm-hmm. um but yeah they were done they were handed in absolutely i mean you know vinnie cletta was very proud of producing a hundred pages in three days if that's what the editor needed and, you know and and while vinnie became known as as the ultimate hack vinnie was very proud of his work mm-hmm. and very mm-hmm. proud that he could come through and that if you needed a hundred pages by thursday they would show up mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. I mean, he would do things like erase people in panels that weren't talking so we don't need them anymore and and silhouette things. And um, uh, like his background people, he'd say, see these dead guys over here? That's background. You ain't those. You know, so. <laughs> the the uh, secrets of the industry right there. <laughs> oh, that, I, I have secrets, but I have to wait for people to die. Okay. <laughs> Well, uh, yeah. oh, sorry. Were you going to say something? I was. I was good. I'm fine. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I I think I have two questions to close this out. I promised you a brief talk, and I want to keep my word on that. Um, as you but, as you can tell, I talk a lot. So no, no, I mean, it's, 
It's great. Yeah. It is great. Um, so curious about, you mentioned painting. So, uh, and you also mentioned just now sort of the organic things that you like to draw. Um, what, what do you like to take up in your painting? I just like portraits. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I have this job. I don't know if I've done 400, 600, 800 of these things by now. Um, there's a man who collects autographs of celebrities, uh, mostly actors and yeah, I guess mostly actors. Um, and the, sometimes they're on a full sheet of eight by 11 paper. Sometimes they're on a, a fortune cookie slip, you know, and um, he hires me to do the portrait of whoever the signature is on that piece of paper. And, and depending upon if it's a sturdy piece of paper, I just might do a full blown watercolor uh -huh. or, or if it's a thin, delicate piece of paper, I might use a marker because it's not wet. It's, you know, fast drawing. Um, but I mean, like I get a piece of paper from like 1939, 39, um, autographed by Orson Welles. It's like, well, there are no make do overs here. Right. You know, I mean, I mean, if I don't screw this up, what am I going to do? You know, uh, consequently, I've done pretty much everybody in the Batman 66 uh -huh. world. Uh -huh. or, and, but but it's weird things like he has Adam West Christmas card. And so I do a portrait of Batman on the inside front cover because it's Adam West signature, you know, or or somebody. A lot of you won't remember who he is. Rudy Valley. I have like nine or 10 Rudy Valley canceled checks. <laughs> you know, and I, I got to paint portraits of Rudy Valley on them. So um, look, I've done, I've done like 25 paintings, drawings of the Alamo horses and dead guys and forts and soldiers. And I've, I mean, I've done a, a, a little bitty ad campaign with oil tankers and, boats based on Jules Verne's weird stuff, you know. So, um, I mean, I enjoyed myself, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but you know, I, p people are infinitely interesting to me. The, the turn of the nose, the, the way they stand on one hip, you know, whatever. So I could, I could just do portraits forever. Um, mm -hmm. but you know, I, I get employed to do whatever it is. They, I mean, I would really hate, doing renderings of um, tractors, for instance. But right. pay, pay me enough and I'll figure something out. So. <laughs> nice, nice. Um, last question is, you mentioned conventions, spaces. Right. I always like to, to give that room for anything that you want to mention in terms of spaces that you like to go, places to connect with people, um, things like that, social media, all of those kind of things. Well, I mean, I, I I have a page on Facebook and it's supposed to have a listing of my conventions for the year, but sometimes those are added to or shifted around or something. Mm -hmm. um, I also, if, if people want to get autographs from me, but they're never getting to the conventions, they can always mail me things and I will send them into CGC or just back to the owner of the comic book. You know, uh, like I'm, I'm on Instagram and I'm on Facebook um, and I belong to this art sort of consortium called MB Artists, as is made by artists, where we sell some of my stuff as big as they call it a, um, a bus a, a bus stop thing, you know, like 30 by 40 or something like that. But yeah. all sizes, um, you know, and I take I, I take commissions and indie comic books and anything else, you know, um, and sometimes it's and. What can I tell you? I don't know that anybody wakes up in the morning and says, I could use some artwork today, you know. <laughs> but there are people who have, like, like, for instance, this guy had a sketch done by Kurt Swan and Ballpoint Pen, however he got it. So he sent it to me and I traced it and then I inked it. So now there's a finished Kurt Swan drawing and then the original thing. Or people have, or, or, my uh, one of my Wolverine, I did the Wolverine miniseries with Frank, and one of my Wolverine pages sold for one hundred and fifty-six thousand dollars. Another one 
is a, at a bargain rate of one hundred and twenty five thousand mm-hmm. dollars, which proves I can't afford me. Right. <laughs> but but for people who can't afford that. Oh, yeah. And the uh, the cover to Wolverine number one, which is voted like one of the hundred best covers of all time was in a show in Seattle and I think it was insured for three hundred and fifty thousand dollars. And I've got of course got like sixty for doing it. Mm-hmm, you know. Mm-hmm. Um so there are people who just want that image and can't afford three hundred and fifty thousand. So I'll do it for less. And and people who want um speaking of Neil Adams, somebody had me recreate a Green Lantern page of Neil's. Um oh, wow. and you know even if you can find it, who says anybody's going to sell it to you? Uh-huh. So I do that. Um, some people want uh, a drawing of their kid standing next to Batman uh-huh. Uh-huh. or or them as Superman. So it's Superman's body with their face on it. Or recently I did a piece for an adult film actress, uh, a very beautiful woman who wanted me to do her as, as Mary Jane Watson. Oh, interesting. So I think it was my first comic book convention when I was 12 or something. And there was this large piece of Wallywood artwork. It was a montage of, I think, Wizard King. And I had like 19 cents in my pocket. And I said to the guy, how much does that cost? And he said, $100. Hmm. Wow. If if I killed my mother and sold her for meat. <laughs> and then And then I said this in an interview and my mother said, what is this killing your mother? It's a joke. It's a joke. <laughs> okay. So, so of course, it'd be nice if I had that piece of artwork now for no other, no other reason than to having it because Woody was a very lovely man. But mm-hmm. I'm sure the thing's worth more than a hundred bucks by now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, and God knows I've sold stuff over the years. It's like uh, 40 bucks. Okay. See it on eBay five years later, 1400 or something. Right. And it, and it sells, you know, it's like, it's an expensive uh, hobby to get into collecting original art. But I think that's why people get sketches and commissions and recreations. So, you know, I do that. And, um, you know, my, my direct email, if you want to write me, is joe at joe Rubenstein art dot com. Rubenstein, R-U-B-I-N-S-T-E-I-N. So, yeah, you know, and somebody wants to contact me, and, you know, some favorite piece of artwork. That I, you know that um, famous EC cover where it's a guy standing in the foreground. He's in his hand. All you see is his hand and a severed head of the wife. And then she's on the floor back there somewhere. Mm-hmm. Well, somebody had me recreate that. Uh, and it, it's like I got real respect for the artist, Johnny Craig, who did the original one. Because yeah. there was just a masterfulness of how he used the brush. And that's, you know, it's another way to learn. So I'm I'm happy to be given art jobs that challenge me that I've never done before, or or sometimes uh, I like it when people who know me from comic books just mm-hmm. hire me to do a watercolor of their little girl because they know I can do portraits. Because thing is with comic books is there's a lot of comic book people who try to do portraits, mm-hmm. but I'm a portrait guy who does comic books. Yes. So. That's where my focus is. So if, so if you go to my Instagram page or my Facebook page, you'll see a lot of portraits of the celebrities from uh, the Avengers movies because I've been commissioned to do them a lot. Nice. So I think that's that. That is that. Well, well, thank you so much for the time. Thank you for the, the creative history and the continuing creativity. And glad to talk with you anytime. All right. Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks so much. Okay.